Hello again and welcome. Recently I made a video where I reviewed this Nissi Digital SWR power meter. This one's the RS70. It's rated for 1.6 to 60 megahertz at 200 watts. If you haven't seen the review, I suggest you watch that before watching this video. I'll supply a link in the description. So during that review, I connected various mismatched loads to the antenna side. And what we saw is this meter was not accurate for measuring SWR. And then I also compared the power level that this reports against a thermal type Rody Schwartz watt meter that I have. And this meter, while it was fairly close at 14 megahertz, once you moved above or below that 14 megahertz, it was really out in the weeds. So a few of you had asked to see this thing apart. A viewer by the name of David Brown had asked about possibly the diodes being the wrong type. Another viewer, Peter Tronics, had written in that this looks very similar to another meter sold by MJF. It's the model 845. What's interesting is when I looked that up, I do believe it is the same meter and it's just rebranded. But through that, I was able to find a review in QST magazine where they looked at the MJF version of this. And they also ran several different mismatch loads and at various frequencies. And their particular one was very close to the specified limits. So I think that there's something wrong with this meter. Now I've gone ahead already and taken this apart. What you have to do is pull this nameplate off of the back. This is just stuck down to a piece of wax paper. I'll go ahead and reinstall it later on. So once that's removed, you can see it exposes these two other screws. So you pull these three off and then we can get to the back of the unit. Now during that review, another problem I was seeing with this is when I had it hooked up to this little battery power bank, this thing was going through a reset. So Rocket Man wrote in and he thought that the power bank that I was using, which happens to be this one from PNY, that this was turning off due to the low load. So instead of using the power bank, let's just plug it into this AC wall wart. So let's just check the backlight timer first. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. So it looks like about 28 to 30 seconds or so. Now again, what I was thinking is when you turn this thing on, this should just remain on because I'm expecting that people are probably not using this with batteries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the backlight on and then we're just going to let this sit with the power on and we'll see if it ever goes through a reset. If it does, what's going to happen is it's going to flash 70 up here and then the backlight is going to go ahead and turn back on for some time. So we should be able to catch it. Just got back from taking the dog outside. I'll have to go back and review the video and we'll see if this thing reset. Alright, so going back and reviewing that video, it doesn't appear that the watt meter reset. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and hooked it back up to our small power amplifier. Currently I'm providing a 14 megahertz signal. Alright, so what I'm going to do is just let this thing sit with 10 watts applied to it and let's just see if it'll reset now. That's interesting. The backlight stays on. Let's go down to like 5 watts or so. Looks like it's going to stay on. Let's go below a watt. We'll try below 100 milliwatts. Hmm. And there it turns off. Let's pump it up a little higher. That's 45 seconds there, so it looks like there's some kind of a minimum power level that the meter requires before the backlight will start to auto turn off. I'm sure that's some kind of a battery saving feature that they've added. It's funny that it's not documented in their little pamphlet, but that's why you do reviews, I guess. So because I haven't seen this thing reset since using this wall wart, I do believe that Rocket Man called it. It does appear to be something different about using this power bank. As I've mentioned before, I've already removed the back cover off of this and had a peek inside. What I'll do is just go ahead and remove that again for you. Really not a whole lot to this. Again, I didn't take it all the way apart, but... Here you can see we have the directional coupler. And there's at least two circuit boards. If you look, maybe off to the left here of the battery pack, you can see that circuit board down inside. So the microprocessor and LCD and switches 
all probably fit down on this mezzanine board down here and then there's probably like a five pin or something connector that ties these two circuit boards together what I can do is trace this thing out real quick again there really is not a whole lot to this let me just get a piece of paper Again, this will be our TX and then on our other side we have the antenna you can see we have a center tap transformer here and it looks like the center tap goes towards the antenna side and we have a couple capacitors in parallel with the resistor and then we have another capacitor that goes up to the output leg and then we have this trimmer capacitor you can see these two capacitors getting swapped in various designs but this is going to be a very standard coupler if we look at the outside legs of the transformer looks like we have a 51 ohm resistor across them and then each side of the leg here goes to our diodes D1 and D2 this will be D2 here's D1 then the output of these is a small capacitor it looks like C6 and C8 so here we have a capacitor C6 and another one here C8 and again these go off to the ground planes and I can't tell if these are in parallel with this or not uh, these two are and let's just see I assume that these are connected at this node and they are and I'll bet you those go off to the ground plane as well which they do okay so this goes off to C5 and this goes off to C7 this then goes off to a pot and this will be R5 and this one will be R4 alright like so and then it looks like it may have a couple of ferrite beads that are in series that would be LF2 and LF1 and then it looks like the output of those essentially go down to the bottom board so this is basically the schematic for the front end unfortunately I was not able to find a schematic for this online I also wasn't able to find an alignment procedure for this now that's another thing that came up in the comments is it was mentioned that the meter probably just has to have a calibration now I want to be clear there's a difference between calibration and alignment and a lot of people seem to get this wrong but if you go to a calibration house if they take your instrument and they compare that against a NIST standard and they validate that this meets whatever the manufacturer's ratings are, that's a calibration. That's not an alignment. So if you're going in there and you're making adjustments to the device, that's alignment. So if you take a meter like ours here and I send this off for a calibration, that doesn't mean that they're going to realign this meter. All they're going to do is check this thing against some known standards to make sure that it's still meeting the manufacturer's specifications. That's calibration. If they make any adjustments to the meter, that's alignment. But keep in mind, when I did the review for this, at 14 megahertz, this thing had a fairly flat response. But as we moved away from that 14 megahertz, so I think I went up to 50 and down to maybe 3, then the error increased quite a bit. So adjusting these two potentiometers is not going to change the flatness of this. Now during that review, one of the first things I did is I flipped the two ports. And we got completely different results between the forward and the reverse power. Again, this should be a bi-directional system. Now that is probably due to misadjustments of the pots. But something else is definitely going wrong with this. So what I'd like to do is see if we can find the actual problem with this. Again, there's not a whole lot to it. How hard could it be to actually fix it? So to see what's going on with this SWR meter, we're going to be using the 3589A 
Again, this network analyzer is good for 10 hertz up to 150 megahertz. And with this little watt meter, it's good for 60 megahertz on the high side. So this piece of equipment is more than adequate to have a look at this. In this case, we'll be using the source port to attach to the TR port of the power meter. And then we can attach a load to the output side or we could leave it open. And then on the input side, we're going to hook up an oscilloscope probe. Well, if you're not familiar with this piece of equipment, you may be thinking, well, it's a 50 ohm input. How are you going to hook up a scope probe to it, especially like a 10x probe like this? Well, this network analyzer happens to have a 1 mega ohm input selection. So it's a very nice feature to have. To use that, all we have to do is attach a BNC to end connector. Now, of course, I'm sure most of you are familiar with scope probes, and you're probably familiar with this thing and these kinds of clips. We're dealing with some fairly high frequency, so this really can't be used. This is what we'll be using. Again, a lot of times you see me, I just wrap wire around the tip, but this gives us a very small ground loop and we can probe the board directly with this. So we can just attach this straight to the input of the network analyzer. And then what we'll do, again, is attach the source port. Doesn't really matter. Uh, again, this doesn't have to be powered up. What I want to do is basically just look at the transformer and check the frequency response of this because I think what we're going to find is as we sweep this, it's not going to be a flat response. So let's go ahead and we'll turn it on. Normally this piece of equipment takes about a half an hour to warm up. We're not going to worry too much about that right now. We're just kind of looking for some gross measurements. We'll select measurement type. We'll do swept network. Then we're going to do frequency and we're going to give it a stop frequency of 60 megahertz. And we'll select range input and you can see here where it says 50 ohms we're going to select the one mega ohm input so what i'm going to do is i'm going to attach our scope probe between one leg of the transformer and ground and you can see we're about 52 db down let's look at the other side of the transformer and you can again see we're about 52 db down Again, right now the output of this is not terminated, so what happens is the signal travels down the bridge, it hits the end of this connector here, 100% of that signal is reflected back. So one of these legs is of course for the forward power and the other is for the reflected, and right now they're going to be the same. Let's go ahead and we'll attach the load. Again, this is just a 50 ohm terminator, nothing special, it's not a CAL standard. And now let's look at the transformer. And again, you can see it's uh, about 52 dB down, just like before. But now let's have a look at the other port. Let's go ahead and we'll reinsert the terminator. And you can see we're down to like 81 dB, 77, a lot of noise down there. And again, I'll go ahead and take this back off. It gives you an idea how that coupler works. So it looks like the two are fairly balanced. So as far as the SWR being off, it probably really is just the two pots. It's a little difficult to connect into, so what I'm doing is I'm taking this little ground clip and I'm trying to slide that down inside of these vias. So there's just not a lot of room. You can see that some of these are located next to the pad. So I'm using this one right here to hook onto. So currently we're looking at 1 dB per division. And you can see Upward, this thing worked okay. This is about 14 megahertz, right about here. So right in the middle of this sloping area. So if they calibrate it there, which according to the manual, it looked like they did, you can imagine now as I move away from either side of this, that the response is not gonna be flat. So just looking at this, I'm wondering about the way they have the transformer wound or the other thing I'm looking at is again this is a piece of coax and I'm expecting that that braid is going to be grounded 
on one side or the other and it doesn't appear that it is so let's just have a look I'm just going to take the ohmmeter because it looks like I can make contact with the braid yep so there you go so now let's go ahead and we'll look at the ground plane eh. so there you go again across the braid and touching the ground plane again you can see here these two pads go off to the ground we'll just look at the connector here and of course that goes off to ground so basically what's happening here the connector screws in probably to the case and then they're picking up that case ground through these six screws that hold the board down to the case but the braid for the coax is just floating inside of this transformer so I would expect essentially if you kind of drew this braid out as it kind of runs through this core I'm expecting this to be just terminated on the one side and then floating on the back side here but the whole thing is floating what we can do real quick is maybe just short that thing out and see what effect it has so you can see I've gone ahead and changed out our black cable I just don't want to ruin that by bending that with such a tight radius so what I'm going to do is be attaching our oscilloscope probe to the one leg of the transformer and then I'm going to take the back side of this X-Acto knife blade and I'm going to try to hold that against this ground plane and then push it up against into that braid and what I want to know if that basically flattens this out at all again this is not going to be a very low inductance path really what we'd want to do is cut away some of that plastic and run a piece of braid around that probably up to this pad here but let's just see if it makes any difference at all so here's the wave again the cursor right now is set to about 14 megahertz and you can see we're right in this linear area so as I move up in frequency you can see the signals reducing as I go down in frequency it's certainly increasing so this watt meter is not going to give you a flat response right now let's try it at 1 dB per division maybe zoom into it a little bit better so here it is without that braid grounded and here it is with it being grounded look at the difference that that makes it's definitely a lot flatter response with the one leg of that attached huh yeah I don't know is that the whole problem with this and then how did it ever get out of the factory working as bad as it does so I wonder do you think that maybe they tried to save some cost because it would definitely take more labor to cut that away and run that braid let's just have a look at that trimming capacitor again we're using a diddle stick so this is made to actually trim these kind of capacitors let's just clock it 90 degrees and let's go back 90 you can see it definitely has an impact on the high frequency response but that's not the majority of the problem and again the pots are not going to affect the flatness of this at all so I think that that's probably the problem and I wouldn't be surprised just with the way that this thing is laid out that maybe that they had taken the braid and then folded that back and just soldered that right down instead of running a separate strap it'd be interesting if you own one of these and you think that yours actually works meaning it's like five percent over the entire frequency range and it can actually measure SWR accurately I wonder if you could pop your cover would you find that braid actually attached I bet you will huh well I think that's gonna be it for this video Hopefully you found it interesting, and those of you that were asking, hopefully it helped answer your questions. I think that's going to be it for now. So until the next video, we'll see you then. Later.